Les Crowder is an authentic bee whisperer, an expert beekeeper, professional educator, and head teacher at the Bee Mindful Beekeeping Academy in Austin, Texas, where he and Natalie B. teach natural beekeeping. For those of you that have been here for the day, you know Natalie spoke, for, spoke first thing this morning. Les started beekeeping at 14 and is both a biologist and true veteran of the beekeeping world. Earlier in his career, he worked for a commercial beekeeper with 4,000 hives. Ever since, he's looked for ways to eliminate toxic inputs in the hive. He now is an internationally recognized expert in natural beekeeping and specializes in top bar hives. He wrote Top Bar Beekeeping, Organic Practices for Honey Bee Health, an authoritative source for natural and mindful beekeeping and a very popular book all over the world. He has been teaching highly popular natural beekeeping classes domestically and abroad for over 35 years, both in English and Spanish, and now offers a professional apprenticeship at Be Mindful. If you're a member of the Sustainable Beekeepers Guild of Michigan, you also have access to this same book through our lending library, and it's readily available for purchase in most venues. Les, I believe you have the uh, sharing capacity, so I'm going to stop my screen share and hand it over to you. Thank you. Um, I'm glad to be with you all. Um, let me go ahead and get this screen up okay. so that I can, uh, let's see, I'm, I'm always struggling with computers, no matter how hard, there we go. Does that show the Be Mindful screen to everybody? Yep, you're on point. You're rocking and rolling today, Les. Good. Um, I'm better at bees than I am at computers. And it's going to be that, always that way. I much prefer bees. Um, but I'm glad you had that prelude because it saves me a little bit of an explanation. But having worked for a commercial beekeeper, and then I was honeybee inspector for a few years, when I quit, a few of my stories will relate to my time in some of those other capacities. Um, and now I'm teaching in near Austin, Texas. <clears throat> and we have bees in all these different types of hives, except the, the flow hive. We, we have a flow hive, but I refuse to put bees in it because I feel like that would be torture to the bees. It's my opinion. Uh, but anyway, so I don't have any bees in the flow hive. But we have bees and all the others. I have 25 plus years of experience with Langstress as a small business with a few hundred Langstress of my own, 200 or so. And then about, well, I built my first top bar hive in 1979. And I kept top bar, bees in top bar hives as my experimental sort of fun hobby hive for about 15 years. And then I built quite a few, well, 30 top bar hives as, as a business plan to see if I can make money selling honey with top bar hives. And it went very well. And I eventually went up to about 200 top bar hives that um, I kept in New Mexico for a number of years. Um, you know, I'm going to start with a Real quick, run through some of these slides. I'd like to start at the very beginning. Obviously, we deal with honeybees, and they live entirely off the produce of flowers. They collect their carbohydrate, their minerals, their vitamins, their fats from the protein, and protein all from the pollen and nectar of flowers. And through their efforts, they then pollinate trees and. One thing I'd like to point out is that it really takes a social insect to pollinate a tree. Um, all of the energy that all of us get originally, really the very beginning of life starts with the sun 93 million miles away. And we that's where all of our food comes from. All of our food is solar energy transmitted to plants, plants absorbing that sunshine sinking their roots deep into the soil, bringing up minerals and nutrients and water and making food. It starts with simple sugars, but then they make 
oils like coconut oil and olive oil, all the different oils. And that's how all of us survive. We can't live except in buried in a rich biosphere full of rich nutrients. You know, I once heard a lady talk about the future of agriculture without pesticides. And she maintained that we couldn't do without pesticides. And her view was, we're going to have to kill all the pollinators. We can't keep them alive and continue to feed the burgeoning population, which I would like to point, down, point out is beginning to stop burgeoning so much. Um, rates are going way down. Longevity is actually headed down. But um, she maintained that we'd all have to live on grains. And I thought, well, I'm not living in that world. My grandchildren need to eat a strawberry. There are nutrients in fruits and vegetables that we can't get from grains that we absolutely need. And we have to stop killing pollinators. Um, just a, a quick background. Here the plants, of course, are rooted in the soil, drinking all their food, their minerals out of the earth with their roots, with the help of um, funguses, mycorrhizal fungi. And there's a whole cycle of carbon and it's all ener energized by the sun. And plants intercept that energy and create the food for us. But they have a problem. And that is that we as humans get to take advantage of sexual reproduction, which generates diversity. In other words, I have two brothers that are very different than I am. We have the same parents, but we have different genes from our mother and our father. That makes us very different. Sexual, sexual reproduction creates a huge amount of diversity. Asexual reproduction would create a bunch of clones. Everybody would be the same. The problem plants have, if we go back to that uh, previous picture, is they're rooted in the ground. They can't go and mate with other plants. They can't pick and choose their partners. They're stuck in the ground. We don't even know what plants know. We know that plants know some things. There's some studies showing that evening primrose flowers, when a bee gets close to the flower, the flower makes more nectar. That's the individual flower. Even other flowers on the same plant don't, but that flower makes sweeter nectar a little bit faster, like as if to say, yes, come bee, come and take a drink. So the flower is aware of the bee. So, but we don't know how the flower knows anything because it doesn't have a single nerve. But the only two ways that plants can participate in sexual reproduction is wind or insect pollination. And of course, I'm gonna zip through this, but they make different kinds of pollen for that purpose. The wind pollen is got wings and it's very light and it can carry for miles. But it's very expensive. It's a high protein, high expense substance to make. And if you dump it into the wind, the vast majority of it lands on the dirt, the wrong plants, you know, only a little bit of it actually hits its target in the female part of a plant of the same species somewhere downwind. Whereas if you put it on bees, it, it's vectored hopefully very specifically to other flowers of that species. And so you don't have to make very much of it, rub it on the bees and she carries the pollen for you. However, there's a problem with all that for large sources of nectar, like a big tree just full of flowers. When a bee goes to that big tree on the right, or no, the left, I get left and right mixed up, so bear with me. Also, I wanna warn you, I have two grandchildren that I don't have complete control over. They may appear two and four years old, but anyway, when a bee goes to that tree, she's overwhelmed. There's plenty for her to do for the, maybe much of her adult life to be just blunt about it because she's only a forager for a relatively few weeks. It might be the whole bloom of this tree. She's gonna visit that one flower and the next and the next and the next. She's not gonna go from this tree over to some cross pollinating tree, gather some pollen, bring it back to this tree. 
back and forth and back and forth. She's just going to go on her tree. But when she goes back to the hive, she pads all that pollen to put in the cells. She's still got several hundred thousand grains of her pollen in her fur. When she goes in the hive, she mixes and mingles with all the other bees from her hive that have gone to all the other trees in that same uh, area for miles around there. And they all come in and they stir all that pollen together. So that by the time she feeds, unloads, gets, uh, see if there's anything exciting happening with the trophallactic exchange, which I can explain later, but then she flies back to her tree now she's covered in the pollen from the trees of her spe the same species from several miles around. And now she's going to cross pollinate every flower she visits on her tree. But it, half the work of pollination occurs in the beehive where the bees mix together and stir that pollen before they carry it back out to their trees that they're working. So a landscape like this lends itself very well to solitary bees and wasps and semi-solitary small little colonies of pollinators they, because they go from plant to plant to plant pretty easily. But a big tree really requires social honeybees or in the tropics of the melipona, the stingless bees, requires social bees that gather in a nest and stir the pollen in the nest for pollination. So our ability to eat fruits and vegetables is directly tied up in the bees. And I like to always put this out as a food for thought. I did pollinate almonds with Tupper hives back in the, I guess, late 90s, maybe early 2000s. Um, and that's a picture of the almonds over there. And we like to look at that and think, yeah, we're in charge of this scene because we dug up the desert, planted the almond trees, watered the almond trees, industrialized beekeeping, put those bees in those trucks, got them to the almonds. We're in total charge of this scene. But in some ways, the almond trees have us making lots of almond trees and the bees have us making lots of bees and feeding, making sure they have lots of almond pollen to feed on for a while. Almond pollination, used to be really good for the bees. Um, back before they started using all the acides, but in particular the fungicides during bloom, my bees would, I would go to organic almond orchards only, and I would come back with heavy built up hives ready to divide because the almonds made a fair amount of not very good honey. Almond honey actually tastes pretty bad. It almost has a nauseating, uh, gives you the shivers kind of taste to it. I don't know how to describe it. It's a lot like almond, essentially, uh, ex almond extract that you get for baking. It, it's not very, by itself, very tasty. Um, but our problem is, I'd like to talk about the difference between intelligence and wisdom. We're very intelligent. We can figure out how to do almost anything we set our mind to do. But we need wisdom to make us see the long-term range. When I was a kid, I started keeping bees. And I remember somebody gave me a couple of hives that they didn't want in their backyard anymore. And I carried them home in my little car. I didn't have a pickup. I just barely you know, had my license to drive. And um, one of the hives didn't do very well. And I finally took it apart and looked at the brood. And I realized it smelled really bad, and there's a lot of dead larvae. And I looked in my American or my uh, ABC XYZ of beekeeping, and I realized boy, they have classic American fowl brood. And the book said that I needed to give them antibiotics, and I thought, antibiotics? That doesn't make any sense to me. I, it just rankled me. But I. I wound up giving, going to the feed store, getting the antibiotic, giving it to them. Finally reading a book that said, or a, a, an article in the American Bee Journal by Steve Tabor saying, 
We should be breeding bees for disease resistance. We should be keeping bees in a way that helps them be naturally disease free. And that is, when I read that, I thought, yes, that's what I'm going to do. And I started right away reading his articles and start trying to read for hygienic behavior and so forth. And um, that's because if you look at the long-term goals, back in those days, people called me a communist hippie for uh, claiming that we should, that you, should, you could keep bees without antibiotics. People told me, you can't keep bees without antibiotics. If you try, your bees are all gonna get sick and then they're gonna come down with a disease and our bees are gonna start robbing your bees and you're gonna spread your disease to all of our bees. It's irresponsible of you to try to keep bees without antibiotics. You have to use antibiotics. Well, that was in most of the books, that was the American Bee Journal, giving you recipes on how to make the patties with Crisco and sugar and teramycin for 30 years. People claimed, you, you can't, you shouldn't even try to keep bees. Basically what we now call the mite bomb. Back then they, were, they weren't saying disease bomb, but that's what they were implying is that we were irresponsible if we didn't use antibiotics. That was short term looking down at how do we keep these, all these bees alive in a bad con condition with old comb in an industrial overly populated way. And just make sure they all stay um, symptom free by constantly feeding antibiotics. Um, long term, we it wouldn't make it doesn't necessarily make sense. But those people at the time weren't thinking long term. Of course, long term we realized that the disease was going to get resistant to the antibody, and that finally happened enough. And now, USDA has come out and said you have to try to keep bees and chickens and turkeys and pigs and et cetera without antibiotics. And we are keeping bees without antibiotics. We are going to keep bees without miticides, without anything to protect our bees from mites. Where nature is still keeping bees in the wild and wild creatures. And that's my inspiration. Nature is a great um, blanket to be wrapped in. It's the only blanket we have. We, I hear talk of um, terraforming Mars. Well, that, pe people are, are insatiable. We're undeniable. We're gonna tinker in everything we can think of. And if we live long enough, we will terraform Mars. But we have to make sure we live long enough. And that means we have to quit unterraforming Earth before we terraform Mars. And what can we as beekeepers do to make beekeeping sustainable long-term? How do we have the vision to look far into the future and make a safe place for bees and our grandchildren and great-grandchildren? And that has to do with removing toxicity. We know that the world is toxic enough. You can talk to, and I have, I, I get around and I meet all kinds of people and I go to other countries I've been to Arab countries, all kinds of countries. Muslims, Mennonites, Buddhists, Baptists, Methodists, we all agree that the world is toxic enough. So we have to detoxify. And I know how to detoxify and I'm beekeeping. And a lot of thousands of people, probably hundreds of thousands of people all over the world know how to totally detoxify beekeeping or never manage to toxify beekeeping. And so we will overcome, we are cleaning it up. But what I'd like to point out is that honeybees and mammals have a long history of antagonism really. For the most part, mammals have been predators of honeybees. Humans were much above bears, we would go into a beehive and strip out most of the honey, even eat a lot of the brood. That's a very common thing. So even today, there's still people that eat quite a bit of brood of honeybees. It's very nutritious. It's very delicious if you 
the taste is often psychological as much as it is um, in your mouth. It's what you believe about it that makes it taste good. But there was a time when human activity was basically predatory. We would destroy a beehive and eat the honey, eat the brood, much like a bear. Um, what I'd like to maintain is that we are learning to become a parasite instead. But, and so I, like, I call this, you know, trying to be a good Godzilla. Honeybees, of course, have uh, stored up all the food that they're going to get from flowers so, so that they have a way of surviving when there are no flowers, whether that be our winter in a temperate climate or the dry season or the rainy season. Sometimes the rainy season washes all the nectar out of all the flowers and there's no blooms and the honeybees have to have stored nectar from back at the beginning of the dry season in the tropics. But we have to have a way of um, approaching bees that makes it easier for the bees to um, not want to sting us because they have found the sting is the way to defend their hive from mammals. Now, one thing I like to point out is that, you know, we can wear the protection and I recommend you wear protection. But when I was told when I moved to Texas, you might work bees without gloves in New Mexico and California, but you, you're going to wear gloves in Texas. Our Africanized bees are going to make you wear gloves or a full bee suit. I thought, well, that, uh, I guess, you know, if I have to, I have to. I own a suit. I wore that suit once last year for one particular bee keeper, his beehive. He told me it was exceptionally mean and he was correct. And also the way he worked it, the way that his attitude was, made the bees very difficult. And I put on the suit because they would have stunned the heck out of me. But I mostly work bees here in Austin, Texas, uh, San Antonio, Texas, with bare hands, a cotton shirt, a veil over my face, blue jeans. No, I, I carry my suit, have it in the pickup if in case I need it, but I haven't, I, I needed it once last year, certainly haven't needed it this year, I haven't done much bee work yet. But I think a lot of that has to do with years and years of practice. So when I was a kid, the first beehive I got was a swarm that landed in my mom's backyard. There's a story attached to that, but I won't take the time right now to tell that story. Uh, you can read it. I think it's in my book. I, I'm pretty sure it's in there. I haven't read that book in a while. Um, but uh, I had this beehive. My mom had a smoker, but she, she never kept bees. She just had an empty beehive that my grandpa and I put bees in. And I was like, yeah, this is so cool. I got to do this. And I knew there was such a thing as a smoker. I read about it in my book in, in the ABC XYZ of beekeeping, but I couldn't keep it lit. I didn't know how to light a smoker and it wouldn't, it seemed like it never had smoke. And so I started learning to open the hive very slowly. And I learned as soon as I breathed out into the hive, the bees would jump up and hit my veil and start stinging my hands and I didn't have gloves. So I was vulnerable and that made me teachable. That means the bees could teach me a lot about how to move around bees. As soon as I made a mistake, they taught me, right? Ouch. And when I, and so what it did is it made me realize that if I would move slow and calm, in particular between them and the sky, or especially between them and the sun, that they seem to notice motion between them and the sky very clearly, and it really jerks their attention up to the motion. If you move fast down below the horizon, they don't seem to notice that from their perspective, I should say. They don't seem to notice that motion as strongly, but when you, cut across. Now bees see polarized light, so they actually see lines coming out of the sun, and it seems like when you move across those lines, that really rankles them. So I learned to move slow and smooth. I later 
I I saw people in the park doing Tai Chi once and I I'd always really been raised in farms and ranches and I thought that awful weird. Like what are those people doing? Moving real slow like that. And then I finally had the chance to take some Tai Chi and I wasn't terribly inspired to do so, but I gave it a try and I was amazed. It's there's a if it's taught well, there's a lot to it about stretching and opening up your body and making you feel a lot better, strengthening your body. And But I talk about moving around bees, it, Tai Chi like, don't jerk, don't jerk. Like once you get your hand over the hive, leave it over there, don't go back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. Leave it over there, move slow, lift the comb, look at it, put it back. Don't bring it over here and then bring it back over there. Watch your motion. Watch your breath. When bees are calm around you, your breath doesn't really antagonize them. It still will drive them away. You can blow on the bee and they'll move out of the way so you can see what's in the cells underneath them, but they won't try to sting you. But when you first open the hive, they're on full alert, like, oh, what's going on? And then if mammal breath comes in, that's like, oh, we're under attack. And they come out ready to attack for defense. So we, we ha you want to watch your breath. When a bee is right in your face, try to breathe in for a while. Then smoke your, your, veil, your veil a little bit while you're breathing out so she can't smell it. Use of smoke really helps, right? It, it really does diffuse their in desire to sting. I think that smoke actually makes them think about a forest fire and it puts them in the swarm mode, like, oh, we may have to tank up on honey and get out of here. We're more of a swarm than we are established colony. They only sting to defend the colony. Obviously they don't sting to defend themselves because they die when they sting. So that's not self-defense. That's the defense of the colony. If the colony is in the threat of fire, there isn't a colony to defend in their mind. It kind of changes their their psychological outlook on life. Um, even though they have a small brain, I think they have a pretty amazing little brain. Um, the time of day, try to open a beehive when it's warm, sunny, ideally when there's a lot of flowers blooming. The bees are so busy, they hardly notice you. And then it, it may seem odd, but anybody who's had dogs or dealt with dogs or horses, I've dealt, I've, raised horses, I've raised cows, sheep, goats. I haven't raised pigs, I'm not really inclined to. But we know that if I approach a dog that people have said, oh, that's a mean dog, and I approach it with a lot of fear or anger, that dog is gonna react to my fear. Now, we don't know how the dog senses our fear. If they read the body language, or if they smell us, smell of stress in our sweat. You know, dogs smell things and bees smell things that we can't even imagine. We are in a sense unconscious to the olfactory world compared to a number of creatures, including bees. I think that bees can smell our sweat when we're approaching the beehive with a, oh, I'm gonna open this hive full of stinging creatures. And it's natural to be afraid when you, especially when you start to have a little fear. What I like to maintain is that we need to lose our fear, but not our respect. There's enough bees in a box to kill you quite a few times over. A hundred or several hundred bee stings all sunk into your face. I, I, I witnessed that where a man got several hundred bee stings all around his eyes, this is in Venezuela with Africanized bees. In his ears, we were pulling stingers out of his nostrils, out of his, off his tongue, where he got him in his mouth. And we were rushing him down a mountain road in the Andes. The Andes gets kind of timid or small compared to the Andes in Ecuador and South, further south in South America. But there are Andes in Venezuela. We were in the, in the end of the Andes there. 
And we got him to a hospital and they, they saved his life. But the bee venom could have killed him because you get enough bee venom in you, it uh, um, acidifies your blood to the point that your kidneys are destroyed and you're dead. And so you don't want to lose your respect for bees, but you want to lose your fear. Tell a quick story. I had a friend in New Mexico when I was raising, selling bees and selling honey. And he was my medical doctor, but I noticed he had a belt buckle that said El Abejero, which is one way of saying beekeeper in Spanish. So I asked him, Es usted Abejero? And he said, uh, yeah, I keep bees. And so we got to be friends and we talked quite a bit and I let him check on my bees and showed him how I did it. And I went and looked at his bees and he had typical Langstroth hives. Then one day I hadn't heard from him in a while and I, he called me and he said he'd like to buy some bees. And I thought, oh, okay. So I made up a nuke for him down by the highway. And I called him when it was, the queen was laying and it was all ready. So, and he came and when he, when he got there, he said, well, don't start working until I get ready. Cause I was already lighting the smoker when he got there and I was, had, a, had a veil over my head, didn't have it tied yet, but I said, okay. So he put on a full bee suit and gloves. He was like so fully protected. I'd never seen him wear all that protection. And I said, Steve, you're sure getting, these bees are very calm and this is just a really small hive. I don't know if you need all that. And he said, oh, let me tell you a story, Les. I, um, I was going to do a conference in, for, he was a medical doctor, as I said, and I had to go to Atlanta for the weekend, for a long weekend, and I didn't want my wife to have to take care of much, so I was going to move the cows to a new pasture, and I was going to irrigate the pasture, and I was going to do all this stuff, and one of the things I needed to do was check and see if my bees need supers before I while I was gone, but I thought that's just a quick check to crack open the lid and look in there and I'll get to that later and I'll get to that later. And he, I put it off all day and finally towards the end of the day with a storm rolling in, I thought, oh man, I never checked on my bees. I'll just take a quick check because they're normally very docile and I'll just crack the lid. And if I see a bunch of bees and comb in between the frames, I'll slap a super on and if I don't see any comb in between the frames or hardly any bees, I'll just lower the lid and I'll figure they'll be fine until I get back. So I did that. I didn't bother with the smoker. I didn't bother putting on my veil. I just thought I was taking a quick, quick check. It was evening time. Sun was going down. He cracked the lid. He instantly got 30, 40 stings right around his eyes and nostrils. It knocked him to the ground. His wife saw him from the kitchen fall to the ground. He didn't fall like carefully, he fell thunk. She came out to help him. She got stung. She drug him. He, they called 911, he was unconscious. He said uh, he went into shock, went to the hospital, they revived him, took all the stingers out of his face and chest mostly and it really scared him and he said I almost quit keeping bees but now I fully suit up I totally respect them so that's the, the you know what I think happens a lot to beekeepers is we start off afraid we suit up we get more and more cavalier sometimes we get a little too cavalier we have to be taught our lesson I like to pe get people to learn that lesson early and not have to push their limits. And then learn to be calm. When you get to where you're calm with bees, they're calm with you. I can't tell you how many people have told me I have a really mean beehive and I need to re you to help me requeen it. And they pay me to help them requeen their hive. And we go there. Recently, I was in San Marcos here in between Austin and San Antonio. And the lady said that, you know, she got all suited up and we started taking the hive apart. She had a K2 
caged queen that she wanted to replace the queen with. And I took the inner cover off and we looked through every comb in the super, every comb in the top brood box, every comb in the bottom brood box. Could not find the queen. I'm wearing gloves, a cotton shirt, open at the sleeves. You know, I'm not very protected. And these are, she said, these are mean Africanized bees in her hive. And I, I, I couldn't find the queen. And I finally, I had the hive all apart and I looked through every comb twice. And I said, well, I'll tell you one thing, these bees are not the least bit mean. And she said, they normally are. It's just because you're here. And I can't believe that that's the case, but my presence and my calmness made her feel pretty calm and she wasn't doing most of the comb manipulation. I later realized, wait a minute, there's a whole lot of bees gathering on that inner cover that I set aside right at the very beginning. I went and looked and there was the queen and I said, oh, I'm not gonna kill her. She's a very nice queen. So we wound up getting a water bottle, making sure all every last drop of water was out of it, putting the queen and a few workers in it and a little bit of comb with some honey poking some holes in it so it could breathe. And I took it and I requeened another hive with it. And I let her keep her caged queen. But a lot of that has to do with attitude. When you approach your bees with a certain amount of anger or fear or mistrust, your body smells of that and they sense it and they return it. Um, I'm gonna maintain, let me look for a slide here. This is, kind of goes into another presentation, which I'm happy to talk about. But, oh, you know what, I, I, I deleted that. One thing I like to point out when you look at Langstroth versus Top Bar Hive is that it makes a big difference. When the frame is down in the box next to the box, like this is a box and this is a frame. And you're going to lift that frame up. The first, let's say the particularly the first frame when you go to lift up a comb. And this is something the bees taught me when I was a kid with bare hands and no smoker, real quick. I could look at the bees and get them real calm down, and I would be calm around them. And when I tried to lift the frame, if I did it real slow and jiggled it sort of slightly, jiggled it as I came up. I would be fine. As soon as I felt that crunch where I crunched a bee, I'd get stung on the hand. It's very difficult to raise a frame and not accidentally crush bees between the box and the frame or between the one frame and the other, the opposite frame where you move it without being able to see what's down below there. It's very hard to do that. With the top bar hive, when you lift the comb up, you lift it up and away and you never crush a bee. You can get to where you can manipulate a top or hive very quickly and efficiently. Have to comb up, put it down, jiggle it just a little bit before you put it all the way down. Give the bees a chance to move out of the way and they would move right out of the way and then put it down and you never crush a bee. And that makes a big difference in keeping them calm and gentle. I mean, if you took my roof off and crushed my granddaughter, I would probably try everything I could to sting the heck out of you, right? Because you killed my, my granddaughter? No, you know, that's not, that's what happens when we go in there and we go and lift a comb up and crunch a bunch of bees. Well, then we're gonna need our protection because we're working bees oblivious to how we're making them feel about us, right? Whereas when we're conscientious, about trying not to crush bees, even if it's just uh, our, our attempt. You know, it, sometimes I crush a bee. And I just say, oh, I'm sorry. And I don't know that that makes a difference that I said anything, but I think it helps me feel calm. And again, it regulates maybe how my sweat smells. You know, we also know that bees are very sensitive to electromagnetic fields. And that flowers, for instance, have a, very weak electromagnetic field. We could only recently measure it. And this was done in Oxford, England. They did it with uh, evening primrose flowers. The flower slowly generates 
a stronger and stronger electromagnetic field as it develops more and more nectar. The bee, when she comes to the flower with a much stronger electromagnetic field of her own, particularly when she's flying, can feel the flower's electromagnetic field in her fur. Her fur either spreads apart if it's a strong or it doesn't if it's very weak. When the bee lands on the flower and drinks the nectar, she discharges the electromagnetic field of the flower. It greatly weakens it. So they developed a fairly strong one. But after the bee visit, it's very weak. That means the next bee that comes along to visit the flower can get close to the flower and feel that the flower just got visited and doesn't have any nectar. She doesn't even need to stop. She can just go to the next flower because what's the use? A bee was just there. So that means the bee is learning from the flower's electromagnetic field. Now it goes one step further. When they continually measured the, my granddaughters, I'm sorry. When they continually measured the nectar and the sugar production, sugar concentration in the flower, as I said before, they found that the flower was making sweeter nectar and more of it when the bee was present. That means the, the flower knows the bee is present. So we're dealing with conscious ent entities. We don't know how the flower knows anything. It doesn't have eyes, doesn't have a nose to smell the bee, can't taste the bee. Somehow it responds to the bee without a brain, without a single nerve in its body. So we're dealing with conscious entities worthy of great respect. And if we treat them with respect, maybe our electromagnetic field generates a little vibe of respect, I don't know. But I find that I can move through bees very calmly and peacefully and not hard to get any stings. When I get a sting, I apologize, smoke it and go on and I'm in fine shape without uh, a lot of protection. And you know, we're in a suit here in Austin, Texas, in San Antonio, Texas. I'd be wearing it a fair amount of the day because I help people with their bees up and down the valleys and around here. It's hot. It's, it's terrible hot to be wearing a suit all the time. It's much nicer to just wear a cotton shirt. And I believe that that vulnerability of, um, that, I, that I have by having bare hands makes me more conscious of my beekeeping motions and how I make the bees react to my presence. I wanna mention one more thing. On the left in this slide, uh, no, the right, uh, right and left problems. But on the right is a double top bar hive. That means that's a top bar hive that I can actually put two colonies in, one at each end. There's a partition in the middle that should be sealed so that they can't even smell each other much. Probably they can smell a little bit or sense each other a little bit, but I've successfully kept two colonies in a box like that for many, many years, 20 plus years. Um, I used to bevel the top so that the top bar sat on a flat surface, the top rail of the top bar hive, where the top, because the bars go across the top and the bees build their comb on the bars. When I did that, I used to notice that as soon as you lift the comb up, the bees wander around in the space you just opened up and they look around and try to figure out what's going on. So now you want to put that top bar back on the rail of the top of the beehive, but there's a bee in the way. And you, so you try to bump and you try to, you can try to smoke, but I'm holding with one hand, I might try to smoke with the other, but the bee won't get out of the way. What I realize is this bee doesn't operate by sight inside the beehive, they operate by feel. And so when they're operating by feel, they're being squeezed between two flat surfaces. They don't. Oh, that's. Um... There's the. They can't feel which way to go, 
So they just stay there and they walk in a little circle like, oh, I don't know where to go. And as a beekeeper, you're like, well, get out of the way. So you start getting frustrated with the bees. The bee is frustrated. She doesn't know which way to go. Your frustration doesn't add anything but aggravation to the air, so to speak. What I found is if I left that top unbeveled, if there was a ridge there, and I'm lowering a flat top bar down on that ridge, the bee is standing on the ridge. She can easily feel, oh, the, I'm being crushed on this ridge. If I go forward, I can get down away from what's coming down. And she gets out of the way much more quickly. So part of the problem is the hive you keep the bees in needs to be designed to not crush bees. And the Langsworth hive is, could take some redesigning to help with that, where you have a ridge instead of putting the flat box down on top of the flat box, give them a little bit of a taper, but that would reduce the insulation. But it, anyway, we, we need to design our hives to make them more easy to lift the comb in and out without crushing bees. Crushing bees, I realize some people say, well, it's like skin cells. You're always losing them skin cells. It's no big deal. I realize it isn't that big of a deal but it, it makes a big difference if you want to keep bees very calmly and peacefully. Um, I alluded to the fact that humans are a lot like um, the, um, the fact that we are like predators to bees when we destroy the hive to get the honey. And that we're like um, parasites, we're learning to be parasites. You know, the Vera mite was a great learning lesson for us. When it came, it was a terrible parasite because it killed its host. It killed thousands and thousands of colonies. And it was much worse than it is now. When it first came into the United States, I remember when it came to New Mexico, there were times when there were five or six mites on every bee. You could open the beehive, my population would just explode and you just it was literally crawling with mites. And nowadays you never see it like that. So what's happening is the host that kill the parasite that kills its host then dies because it doesn't have a host. So it's not very fit. And by breeding, letting nature take its course, particularly in the Amazon basin and in the Caribbean where they didn't have the use of miticides, we started breeding mite resistance into the bees. The bees start breeding it into themselves, I should say. Grooming, VSH, et cetera. But also the mites, the mites that survived were the mites that didn't kill their host. So they started toning down their reproductive rate. I have a strong hunch that if we could look at mites in Puerto Rico or Jamaica, where they keep bees with relatively few miticides, I got a picture of Jamaica here, right there. These people have been keeping bees without miticides for a very long time because it was never easy for them to get them. That's me and the blue shirt over there with a hive tool in my hand. Um, and so the, they started developing, of course they have the so-called Africanized bee, which is helpful, it's a great bee. I work these bees here all the time with bare hands. They're not that big of a deal. They're a little bit, they're quick. They quickly get over and, and get back. They calm right down right away. Um, so these people have been letting the bees breed themselves and they've been also breeding the mite. I bet if you went and checked the mites reproductive rate in Jamaica, and then check the mites reproductive rate in Apis serrana in Asia, you'd find that the mites in Apis serrana breed at a much higher rate than the mites in Jamaica, Puerto Rico, most of South America, Central America, because they, the mites have bred themselves to become a better parasite of Apis mellifera in these properties. 
where we haven't been interfering. When we use a miticide, we break nature's ability to make that balance happen. By, by not using miticides, only the mite-resistant bees, the mite-tolerant bees can thrive, and only the mites that don't kill their host to have a thriving host. A host needs a thriving, a parasite needs a thriving host, right? So that's the key to, um, to be keeping peacefully. Um, there, Crow, the guy that's lighting the smoker, who is not very far away from Africanized bees that have already been opened. He's just making sure the smoker's going good. But you know, these people are not afraid of their bees at all. And they learn to be very calm around their bees. Granted, some of them are wearing full suits. Um, I guess I'd, I'd open it up for questions because I, I can run through the range here. You know, here's a typical situation of bees under attack, being robbed out, getting robbed by um, yellow jackets and other bees. And once the robbing frenzy gets in full swing, the whole neighborhood tries to get in on the act and that indeed could be a source. You know, if I were to ever do anything about mites in a beehive, which I haven't done anything about mites in a beehive for almost 20 years now, let's say, well, 1990-something is when I got some Russian bees and quit doing anything about mites, except looking for them a little bit. But if I saw a beehive getting really mite-infested, I would probably put a little bit of cedar bark in my smoker, puff the smoke in there, which would kill most of the mites, and then I'd requeen it just to get a mite-resistant breed in there and get rid of those mites. But, um, and I'm not above using hornet traps to get rid of the um, yellow jackets. I feel that the, his the future of our existence does not lie in better toxicity. We've tried that. We're about up to here in toxicity. It is time to detoxify, time to de throw out the plastic. One thing I'm proud of with the Tupper Hive is that you don't need one ounce of plastic. One more quick story I have to tell here. Storage problem. When I worked for a commercial beekeeper, we had 4,000 hives. That meant that we had 35,000 supers. That's what my boss claimed. I never counted them, but uh, we had a huge warehouse that we would fill all the way to the roof with supers. And one of my jobs in the fall was to stack five 10 frame deeps full of wet comb, throw down a paper towel, squirt a chemical on the paper towel, put newspaper, five supers, paper towel, chemical, newspaper, all day long for weeks. That chemical smelled real strong. He gave me a paper mask, which did no good whatsoever. It was, might as well not worn it at all because the chemical went right through the paper. And I would come out of that warehouse and walk home. It'd take about half an hour to get home. And my breath would smell of that chemical for several hours. So I was absorbing the chemical in my breath and into my body and exuding the smell of it for several hours. Finally cleaned up around the barrel and it had a skull and crossbones on the barrel. And I asked Jim, the boss, I said, Jerry, what's this skull and crossbones all about? He said, oh, heck. Them environmentalists claim it'll cause cancer, but it won't hurt you none. It turns out to be ethylene dibromide. It, it, it's been banned now. But back in those days, you could use it for, in all kinds of farms. It was used to kill nematodes in soil for potatoes. They used it heavily on strawberries. And then they realized we're giving farm workers cancer and we're contaminating groundwater permanently with this heavy, heavy doses of ethylene dibromide. And it's a, really a forever chemical. Once you get it in your body, it's gonna be in the body the rest of your life. It's gonna get 
stuck in the fatty tissue and you, you, you don't break it down. It doesn't break down. And then EPA banned it from all agricultural use except beekeeping. And they put that in the news and that infuriated the beekeepers. They didn't want the news to say that they were using a carcinogen in their beekeeping. One guy told me, you know, people think of beekeeping is kind of something pure. If they hear about that, they're gonna think it ain't pure. And I thought, well, dude, if you're using ethylene dibromide, it ain't pure. It's pretty bad stuff. And, you know, later somebody said, well, you, you didn't get cancer. Well, I did. Now I got a cancer quite a few years later. And, but I think that there was that exposure to a powerful carcinogen, it was, you know, a knock on my door and I'm still considering myself a cancer survivor. And I'm still very cautious about what I do, what I eat, et cetera, because that's not a fun sort of, I was told at one point that I should have my affairs in order. There's nothing left to do. Oh, well, it's now been seven years and I'm feeling pretty good. But um, the thing about top archives is it gets you out of storing supers. Nowadays, you're supposed to use paradichlorobenzene mothballs. Well, that's still carcinogenic. It's not as carcinogenic as paradichlorobenzene, but it's still very carcinogenic. The benzene is, is, is carcinogenic. So we need to learn to keep bees in ways that we don't have to do any toxic chemistry of any kind ever. You know, a freezer can work to store the combs, but I work with beekeepers in foreign countries who aren't gonna have the opportunity to buy a freezer just to put combs in. Um, so to me, not storing comb by just crushing and straining the comb makes a lot of sense. It makes, it makes it um, one less job, one less temptation to use toxicity. Okay, now I'd like to go ahead and open it up for questions. Thanks, Les. Thank you so much. Appreciate all the information you provided so far. You know, I did have a question come up when I was thinking about operating within your colonies without the protective equipment, you know, based on, you know, kind of what you're putting out there, um, how your frustrations and uh, your uh, chemical makeup can be communicating things that the bees are picking up on um, and how the, nat the natural world uh, has this, this network of uh, information transmission going on all around us that we're completely unaware of because we're not so in tune to it. Um, even, even, you know, a good example is uh, your home garden. Tomatoes are constantly engaging in warfare with other plants in the garden. They have this chemical biological warfare going on on a regular basis and that they will prevent each other from uh, uh, what's the word I'm looking for, pro from prospering if they're planted too closely to say another another plant that it's not supposed to be planted next to and that's where we get you know the ideas for companion planting but um when you work hives later in the summer let's say when hives might be more more defensive might mm -hmm. a colony might be more defensive because of forage availability things of that sort do you feel like your approach is still as effective then yeah um <clears throat> i mean you have to keep in mind the season as you're working bees. And bees will teach you the nuances of spring, summer, winter, fall in your area. You know, like if you're in Phoenix, you make most of your honey in December, January, February. If you don't make any honey in Minnesota in December, January, February. So you have to get very in tune with your circumstances. And one thing that I remember one time I, I was keeping bees in New Mexico and I had two interns. And they said, you know, you work us pretty hard. If you didn't have us, you wouldn't get near as much done. And I said, you know, I have to take time and explain everything to you guys. I think it takes me longer. <laughs> and so then they said, okay. So we came to a bee yard and I had 20 beehives in the bee yard. They said, we're gonna send the pickup and we're gonna time you. And I went through the bees and they were in top of our hives. And it was the middle of summer 
or towards the end of summer, when they're more defensive, I would crack the back of the topper hive, go up to where the bees were building comb, check through the comb they were building to see how fast they were building, maybe rearrange a couple of combs, see some brood. I just wanted to see some cap brood. I didn't, and as soon as I saw some cap brood, if it looked good, great. Put it all back together and on. I averaged two and a half minutes per hive. So I think a lot of times we think we got to take the hive all apart and that's very destructive to the bees and that gets them more and more aggravated, particularly when they're robby. You do not want to be opening up bees unnecessarily when there isn't any flowers available and they get to robin and the bees around here, the tropical or Africanized bees can get very intensely robby and it can make them sting everything that moves and sting each other. And so you want to be very concise and make sure that like when you harvest honey, you don't spill anything on the outside of the bucket as best you can, that you keep honey from dripping around. And then, you know, I've also had like honey on my hand and lots of bees land on my hand and lick it. I had a tarantula hawk wasp come and land on my hand, put up her antenna like she's trying to get the bees to scare her, scare away a little bit. And then she's licking off my hand. I'm like, wow, this is so much fun. Me and these bees and this tarantula hawk wasp. That's a wasp about three inches long. Beautiful, beautiful blue and red wasp. And here it is sitting on my hand, licking my finger. I can't even hardly feel it. It was so light. But, you know, it, it can be a beautiful experience, but you have to lose that fear, but always keep a lot of respect. Think this is a creature I respect. And then keep the seasons in mind and keep the um, disturbance to the minimum. We're trying to be, I look at us as parasites, really. We're going to coexist with this creature and we're going to suck a little honey out of the beehive for ourselves or a little whatever out of for ourselves. Maybe just pollination for ourselves, but we're using these bees in a slightly parasitic way. We're trying to be the most gentle, interfere with them the least. Much of what we do interferes with their busyness. And we want to make it so that we get them in a state where they want to swarm and say, oh, fine, let's swarm right here. And you make a divide. But anticipate what they were going to do before they did it themselves, rather than, oh, it's April 15th, it's time to make divides. So it's a matter of being cautious. That's great, Les. Thank you so much. A couple of people noted they've practiced similar approaches to their bee colonies that you've emphasized here, and being gentle is important. Uh, one of our commenters was that they typically work their colonies with just a cotton shirt and have only been stung a couple of times. I know here in my apiary, I'm likely to operate without any protection because I'm typically stopping in after my day job or before the, the day gets on and uh, I don't always have everything with me or in my possession. And sometimes that can encourage some feistiness if I'm uh, moving a little too quickly or uh, being a little too aggressive. So, well, they're good. They're teaching you. They bit sure there. are. Yeah. And yep. that's the, they're the best teachers. And when there's a crunch, I just put them away. It's time to, it's time to move on. <laughs> good if you can do that. Yes. Yeah. Well, Les, I appreciate you so much. I'm so happy you were able to join us. It's always great to hear from you. I appreciate sitting um, and listening to you, you talk and, and give us information from your experience. It's been a pleasure. Well, thank you. I've enjoyed it. And I hope you guys have been, been checking in, in and out intermittently. And I'm enjoying your conference. Excellent. I'll be sure to get you links to the videos once we get them all edited so you can catch up on anything you missed. Thank you. Have fun with the grandkids, hey? Oh, yeah, I always do. <laughs> Store up energy for that one. Yep. Thank you. Bye-bye. All right. Bye-bye. 2018. 2000 to 2001, it went down to 21. So those first five years averaged out to 42% loss. But I can't say that it got better because not too long after that, 
I think one of the new forms of deformed wing virus came through and losses went back up again, but then they leveled out. Anyhow, you come to the last five years here, uh, and I'll include this year because I was just out today at the uh, hives and every one of them, they're zooming in and out. They're bringing in maple pollen. I'm quite certain they're in good health and they've made it. So start in three, four, five, seven years ago, I had a 10% loss. Next year I had zero. The year after that, it was zero. The following year I had a 3% loss. Then I had two more zero years, or no, then I had a zero year, a 5% and a zero. And for me, I only maintain about 30 colonies. So these five and 3% are basically just one or two colonies being lost. Uh, one thing I didn't put in this article, I wish I did, and I think the person you're talking about asked about it, rural accounts. Uh, they were wild in the beginning. Nowadays, I have trouble finding varroa. I mean, and I'm to the point where, you know, the, there are some of the big wazoos in the world may want to knock me for this, but I'm about ready to say to heck with varroa counting. <laughs> you know, I've got colonies that have lived 26 years. They're doing just fine. I'm not having any problems. Why do I want to get in there and disturb the bees more? with varroa accounts when I'm not finding any. <laughs> I know there's some in there, they're in every colony, but I think the bees have them under control. And I'm about to the point where I'm ready to give up on all this varroa account nonsense. Takes up too much time, energy, disrupts the bees. Uh, I no longer see a need for it with me. Well, Terry, you definitely are providing us with an excellent example for us to follow and to maybe even replicate in our own apiaries. You give us hope that it's possible. I'm so grateful again for you to come today. Thank you so much for your presentation. I'm going to go ahead and give everybody some following closing remarks and some follow-up comments and then uh, wish you and bid you all a good night and a good evening so you can get some rest because I know that I'm tired. My brain is full, but my body's exhausted. So it's my, been wonderful. My stomach is empty too. Oh yeah, yeah. I didn't think about a dinner break. Uh, I figured we could we could make it all the way to the end. So let me uh, let me finish up and uh, conclude with everybody by giving you an overview of the Sustainable Beekeepers Guild of Michigan Facebook group is open to everybody. Uh, it is an open forum. You don't have to be a member of the club to participate in that forum. We also have the Facebook group for the Michigan Treatment Free Beekeepers. It was a little bit of a different uh, posting and uh, conversation uh, policy between the two groups, but uh, the reason for that is, is clear and laid out in those policies on those particular venues. We want to remind you about some of the efforts that we're hoping to aim for uh, with our queen breeding and nuke exchange program for beekeepers. We want to be able to establish a network and a co-op of beekeepers that are practicing a lot of the things that you're hearing and experiencing today so that others can benefit from the genetics in the region and also improving the genetics in your region. I like to say I'm not an altruistic beekeeper. I want you to have better bees so that your better bees are helping my bees be better also. I probably will never say that the same way twice. Uh, we are also working on a mentor group uh, network development. You know, we want other beekeepers to have access to mentors um, who are, you know, providing treatment free and chemical free practices. And, and it's not just the chemical free treatment free aspect of beekeeping, but you're learning basic hive management. You're learning what you need to do when it comes to splitting. You're learning about bee biology and you're getting hands on frame time. And then Terry had mentioned that we're discussing how to create a hive or badge program for beginners. We want you guys to be able to earn a hive. You know, the Bee Guild has a plan for you to complete these processes. And at the end of this period of apprenticeship, you not only get the badge of honor of having had completed that, but we'll provide you with your first nuke. We'll give you your first set of bees and we'll give you some good bees. All right. We also want to encourage you to reach out to us. Send me an email, send me a text, Whatever you need to do, stop by the web page for the Guild, shoot us future speaker and topic recommendations. And the last thing I wanted to cover is that we're working on a, 
a forum for individuals to come together and share other than the Facebook venue, not that that's not sufficient, but a sustainable beekeeping guild where people can come together and they can express their views and opinions and they can share like-mindedness in these efforts without having to face the perils of some of the more mainline forums where you can easily get distracted or even harshly treated for just having the idea or notion that it's possible the bee could take care of itself and its genetics. You will want to be able to give people that place and venue to learn from each other on a consistent basis. We don't have to just wait for conferences and, and meetings to get that information. You can go right online, go into that forum and share that info with each other and have access to each other. With that, I thank you all so much for those who have stopped by. I thank you all so much for hanging in there with me and to the last 20 or so participants that are just there by a thread. Have a good night, enjoy your spring, and we'll be talking to you soon. Good night.